my tax behind here real quick so no one can. All right, good. So uh, this is a case that we had uh, just yesterday. And just to get other people's ideas about this, I I'm convinced that these entities are often lumped together, but I, I think they kind of represent at least somewhat different diseases because they really do occur in two different subsets of patients. So this is a 24 year old woman who comes in with um, cough, shortness of breath, some respiratory infections. And, you know, and I've shown cases like this before where you have a very predominantly central bronchiectasis uh, relative in the areas where out where there's not superimposed infection. Uh, like here in the right upper lobe and right middle lobe. In lingula, the bronchiectasis really is central. It, it, it stops at the level of the kind of, for the most part, segmental, maybe going into the subsegmental airways, but trachea is very floppy and enlarged, um, got very large measurements. The main stem bronchi are very enlarged. And, you know, for me, this is a pretty classic case of what I think is the kind of true cases of monier kuhn um, where you get this, you know, massive trachea and bronchi and then associated, you know, more central bronchiectasis, first to fourth order, secondary to that's where the cartilage that's deficient is located. Um, and we see this, I don't know, I personally see this maybe once a year, or once every other year, relatively rare. And then the second form to me, which is, I think, the form that most people kind of talk about and the one that we see more commonly is the one that we tend to see in much older men who are smokers or have a history of smoking where we have this, you know, very large patch of similar looking patchless esophagus or trachea and, and main stem bronchi, but don't have the involved uh, kind of, you know, the, the central bronchi are a little regular, but don't have that degree of bronchiectasis. And, you know, you wonder, is it just different exp degree of expression and of the same process? You know, this again occurs predominantly in older males, like strikingly male, like 20 to one incidence. Um, whereas the ones that I've seen in younger patients really has a more equal male to female distribution is more commonly associated with Elos Danlos. Um, but this one, radiologically also meets the criteria for tracheobronchiomegaly, which is like three centimeters for the trachea and 1.8 for the left and two for the right or vice versa. Uh, what do people think about that? Do they think it's the same disease process just with different amount of penetration? Or do you think that the, because no one does, no one does biopsy on these. No one actually confirms that there's some elastic, uh, elastin deficiency leading to this. Yes, so, I thought you I thought you were going to say that the first case was Williams Campbell because the tracheal and bronchial and, and central bronchial dilation is pretty modest compared to uh, the next orders of airways going out there to the to the segments. And so I thought that you were going to present that as um, Williams Campbell syndrome because I think that's that's what I've seen for that pattern before. Well, so for Williams Campbell, I mean, this woman's trachea here was like 3.6 centimeters. Oh, that's true. And, yeah. It's really and big. she's, and she, and her main stem bronchi are, I mean, we measured them. They were about 2.6 centimeters in some areas. I mean, here you can see quite large. And uh -huh. that, that's usually conspicuously spared in Williams Campbell. And the bronchiectasis is, you know, usually most severe at the segmental and subsegmental level in Williams Campbell, which is involved to some degree here. But you know, Williams Campbell, in my mind, shouldn't really have a very large patchless trachea because that those fibers aren't deficient. So, uh, so Seth, the way I think about this is the tracheobronchomegaly is sort of the end point of multiple pathways, whether it's due to recurrent infection and injury and remodeling versus deficient fibers of elastin or muscle or deficient cartilage. And, you know, you probably see that different appearance in different populations based on, you know, age. And a lot of these men have COPD. So there may be. Yes, they're exactly. They all have mechanics COPD. in the lung yes. 
that it's sort of just a plumbing problem and wherever your weak points are as things get abnormal. But, you know, the second case you showed had those striking like accordion appearance. Um, you have it here too, but the other ones have the diverticula. Yes, exactly. Elevated pressures. And, you know, even Williams Campbell, you kind of wonder there's a spectrum of that too, because the literature describes the majority of cases presenting in children. Yet we see, we've shown on this webinar, many cases that, w that would, at least meet the description in adults as new diagnoses. You know, they had symptoms for years, but not since childhood or maybe, been, you know, sort of progressive. And you wonder if it's just variability of, you know, how long it takes that injury to present itself. Right. Um, and I agree with you. I think the ones we see with the diverticula and the accordion appearance, like in the older smokers, I, I think it's relation to longstanding COPD um, and just distal obstruction causing those outpouchings. In you know, cases like this, you know, I don't know. I I think Williams Campbell would have definitely been on the differential for me. If and I, the answer is I don't know. You know, these all wind up being imaging diagnoses. Um, you know, she doesn't have a history of recurrent infections in childhood. She just kind of came to presentation a few months ago um, and has no real other imaging. And to me, I've always been trained that if the trachea and bronchi are really the central ones are really enlarged, like in this case, that it's you're going on the moyer kuhn spectrum. Whereas if the you know central airways are more normal, and then you get into this this you know I think you get into a heterogeneous mix when you get into this area out here because that could be either. Um, I, but that's just how I look at it. I'm not saying I and we just don't get path on these. Like no one looks at these to look for the elastic fiber deficiencies. Um, and they don't do genetics on them either. So, you know, when I reviewed the literature on this stuff for both Munir Kuhn and, and for Williams Campbell, uh, if you look at the cases with these names on them, they are so heterogeneous and there are so are. many uh, with different appearances. I, I think you should just say this person has bronchiectasis and it's central or, you know, it involves out to this level and stuff like that, and then not try to, to nail things. Uh, beyond that. It's just too squishy. Yeah, I agree. It, a lot of it, I mean, there's cases that are clearly one or theoret, you know, the other, and then there's this, this whole spectrum that are just overlap. Um, but I, I thought that was interesting because we got both of those cases within a very, like a week of one another, the one versus the other. Uh, and they're going to test her for Elos Danlos, you know, to see if that's, because that's obviously uh, associated with the Bonier Kuhn or supposedly associated with it. So that was the first case. This is an other interesting case that doesn't really have, we have a pathologic diagnosis, but not really a diagnosis. So here's a guy with a, not a great chest x-ray. I'm sorry about that. Maybe if I blow it up. Um, and I think we can all see that there's a diffuse abnormality, very high density material, uh, somewhere between nodular and reticular. I don't know how people want to describe it, but not really fibrotic. There's not a lot of volume loss. Here he is uh, about six years later and very similar pattern. Uh, he's complaining of worsening shortness of breath, although he's had shortness of breath for a long time. And then this is his most recent CT. And if we see that it's all high density material. Um, and we also have a CT from that other chest x-ray, which was about seven years ago, which also shows that it's, you know, very high density material. And it's the, the areas that this high density material, which I can tell you was ossified material on pathology, uh, is predominantly in the upper lung zones, predominantly anteriorly, uh, but relatively diffuse. There is some architectural distortion, but it's not striking. Uh, you know, we can see that even where these airways are surrounded, it's not too impressive. Uh, and then down here we have this, I, you know, I think the fibrosis is actually, there's some fibrosis here in the lower lobes. Uh, this has been unchanged for six, seven years. We can see some bronchial dilations, bronchiectasis and uh, ground glass opacity. And the question is, well, this patient underwent a biopsy, and this was all dendriform pulmonary ossification. Um, and it was sent out and read by, uh, I think was sent to Bill Travis at whatever he is in New York at um, was there, Cornell. Was there amyloid in it, or was there was there no amyloid? No amyloid. Okay. So it was just read out is exuberant dendriform pulmonary calcification. So 
the only history we have on this guy is youngish was that about 20 something years ago he was in a major motor vehicle collision um had not much chest damage but had a big uh le you know had intracerebral hemorrhage and was in the eye he was in a coma for a month and we don't know he was trached um and potentially had some sort of lung injury when he was trached and all this stuff going on so we don't know what the cause is i'm thinking this is from some severe form of ard he had no renal failure and again you're not this is it's dendriform pulmonary ossification it's not calcification and given this kind of findings here i'm thinking it's from long-term intubation with AR, some sort of ARDS kind of injury that somehow led to this. But I don't know. It's complete speculation. Um, I've just never seen this amount without, you know, no real classic fibrosis. It's interesting know that the distribution is in the non-dependent lung, which with your, I think your theory of an acute lung injury makes sense because that would have been right. something that was probably best recruited and maybe yes. over, and you said it was 20 yeah. years ago, they probably didn't do the uh, sort of the low tidal volumes and stuff. They exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's, and that's what we were thinking. And that's what I was thinking. And I, I, right. And no idea. I just, I don't know if anyone's seen any, I was looking in the literature and couldn't find much on this. I don't know if anyone. So um, Seth, do you think he might've had an acute kidney injury at the time that he was traumatized? And so he could have, but I always thought, you know, of the renal failure and the acute, is still calcification and not ossification, but I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, the, the thing is that those fibroblasts can go on and become osteoblasts, you know, when they're recruited for any reason, including idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I've seen it in people who uh, even who've who've aspirated. So you can you can get ossification if you have a situation that leads to scarring and right and fibrosis. And I've seen it in aspiration and. Um, and I, I thought about renal failure uh, and, you know, mm -hmm. now he doesn't and there's no history. We have no records except that he was trached for a long time and had was, you know, had major injury, was in a coma, had major brain injuries and which he's better now. But uh, but I, that was another thought. Um, I just and the other cute little finding just totally unrelated is that he has a circumflex aortic arch. So mm -hmm. anyways. Uh, I thought that was just, I had just not seen that before. Um, and then this is quick. Oh, that's the one we already showed. And the last one, I thought this was just cute because I've never seen this before. This is a guy with an outflow tract VSD, which I haven't seen many of right here. It's covered up by a sinus of valsalva aneurysm. But what was interesting to me here was the two kind of pulmonary arteries. You have one that goes, and I'm sure someone here has shown something similar. I just haven't seen it. One going anterior in its normal location and then one going posterior and it's not a sling because it stays anterior to the esophagus so it's kind of like uh left upper and the left lower low pulmonary artery one going from its normal origin and one rising kind of from the rpa or a little more distally and supplying the left lower lobe oh i've never seen that yeah i, th I thought that was interesting and then for yeah for kicks the little Sinus of Alsalva aneurysm covering up the outflow VSD. But anyways, I've taken enough time. Those are those are my cases. Thank you, Seth. All right. Uh, Howard or David? I can go any time if you like. All right. Okay, so the first one I'm going to show you um, isn't that exciting, but it's it's some nice anatomy. So let me just uh, blow that up for you. And first off, just give you a look at this without any history at all. So see if you see anything of some, let's say, anatomic interest. And then I'll give you the history that I received initially, which was two words that said foreign body and see if that helps at all. And then I'll give you the real history, which was this is a person that came to the ER and he came to the ER after he had had a meal and he felt that what he ate, which turned out to be turkey and mashed potatoes, 
didn't really pass into his stomach. So he had a sense that something had gone wrong with the passage of what he ate into the stomach. So let me bring up just an annotated image. And this here, of course, is a lung media spinal interface. And this here is meant to depict the usual interface of lung with mediastinum in the azigoesophageal recess. And instead of that interface being where one usually sees it, it is there, but it is displaced laterally. So that is the interface there. So of course, what we have here is a distended esophagus. It's filled with the food that he described, which was the turkey and the mashed potato. So he's got esophageal distension. So after getting that information, things kind of made sense. And they were able to help him, at least initially, with an EGD. And you can see there that they managed to push the material into his stomach. And exactly what's going on isn't yet apparent, but they're going to obviously evaluate him again for esophageal obstruction a little bit later. But there you can see the abnormality. So this was esophageal distension with food. So this is another patient that I saw, I was just happened to be on call. And the context of this one initially was a patient with planned liver transplantation. And they were evaluating the patient for any pathology or anything that might preclude doing a liver transplantation. So the image patients here, and they usually say rule out malignancy or anything else. So I looked at that in that context, and I did see right middle lobe atelectasis, but I could tell that there was no obstructing lesion there. And presumably it's atelectatic because of secretions in small airways that you see there. So that was incidental finding number one, which I thought I could explain in a patient that was quite ill. You can see the patient's intubated here. But the other finding that I saw was up here. So I saw opacity in the left supraclavicular region. And then the one that initially was very perplexing was to see this abnormality here related to distal aortic arch. And I'll make this a bit bigger, mural abnormality in relation to the origin of the left subclavian artery there. And perhaps a little bit related to the carotid artery. So I saw that, and I saw that, and I saw that. And of course, you know, if you just see this and get hung up on this, you'll think about, could the patient have a vasculitis? How does that even fit into the whole picture here? So I looked and looked in the medical record and then found a potential explanation which satisfied me, which they didn't tell us about, which is revealed here that a little while before this, there were apparently five unsuccessful attempts at left jugular vein catheter placement. So a strong speculation is that during the course of that, they may have passed a guide wire or did something that actually produced a fair amount of injury to these brachiocephalic arteries, maybe with a guide wire. And there's actually intramural hematoma and some bleeding up here associated with it. So I think that's a satisfactory explanation. So the importance of getting HG when you can get it obviously helps <laughs> for cases like this. Has anyone ever seen uh, anything quite like this where there's a fair amount of pathology in the wall of arteries like that? Hmm. No. I speculate that they, they got into the artery or guide wire got in there or something like that. Do you think it's just tracking back up along the branch vessels? Because I agree, I think the carotid's abnormal too. Yeah. So I think there was some bleeding there. So <clears throat> what was the what was the follow-up? Did they um there was no follow-up in terms of any further evaluation of this? I presume that once they saw my report, presumably they were satisfied and I, I didn't feel comfortable pushing them anymore about what that was all about exactly. But do you think, finding that. think there's a danger that the person will get a pseudoaneurysm or um, don't after, know? Did they follow up and see if the mediastinum, you know, cleans itself up? Nope, they went ahead with the transplantation that I do know. 
So I guess they weren't terribly alarmed by that. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think there's um, there's a risk of arterial injury here and, and that something's not going to resolve? Or is well, everybody happy? You know? I think they would. I mean, I think don't they follow it. treat these with like um, aspirin or something? I don't know. But I'm not sure you want to give that to a recent transplant. Yep, I don't know. Okay, let me show you. This is a really interesting case. We've seen this before, but it's um, a lovely example of this phenomenon. Make sure I'm showing the right one. Okay. So the presenting chest radiograph looks like this. And we clearly have diffuse interstitial edema, but it's right greater than left. Let me show you the CT that was done subsequently, and I think that this was a CTPA for pulmonary embolism. And you'll see that we have diffuse interstitial edema and pleural fluid. And what was also described down here were nodules. And because we've seen this before, we recognize these nodules in the lower lungs as being what we call septal lakes of interstitial edema, right there, rather than some separate nodular parenchymal disease. And we see the pleural fluid. So once seeing that, I was pretty confident when we were consulted that these nodules are pseudoparenchymal nodules, but they're septal lakes of interstitial edema. And then the question is, why does this person have pretty florid interstitial lung edema. So initially he had a cardiac ultrasound that showed mitral valve prolapse and maybe some mild regurg. But because of the dramatic findings, he then went on to have a transesophageal echo procedure. And I'll bring that report up alongside, as you can see there. And that really clarified that there is substantial abnormality involving the mitral valve with mitral regurgitation and you can read that description. And here is a TEE that goes along with that. So here's some images from the TEE that will show us that bulging leaflet that you can see there, pretty dramatic. So we have a nice example of asymmetric lung edema from substantial mitral valve regurgitation. So this fits very nicely and all makes sense. And of course, it's pretty bad, so you undoubtedly have to have that mitral valve attended to. That's nice. But a, really, a nice case, isn't that? Yeah, that's very nice. Okay. And the last one I have, and I'm trying to remember. Okay, here's this case. So this is a presumptive diagnosis, but based on the histories, you'll see a pretty strong presumptive diagnosis. So the chest radiograph in this patient with, I think, cough and, and dyspnea, but not an acute respiratory illness, looks like this. So clearly abnormal, a little bit hard to describe. Um, there are bilateral subsegmental sized opacities. And I will now show you, I'll bring up the coronal CT that goes along with this. That nicely depicts, if I can get that to not do that what this chest radiograph looks like or why it looks that way. So here is the CT. And I hope you all agree that the dominant finding is mosaic attenuation. And the amount of actual opacity in the lungs is relatively modest. And I don't think that I have an expiratory CT here, but that is the dominant finding. I'll bring up the thin cuts here and show you that. This is what it looks like. So there's some mild reticulation, but otherwise mosaic attenuation, GGO, but a very dramatic mosaic attenuation with additional opacities in the lungs, whether you call them ground glass, but not discrete central lobular nodules, more confluent geographic ground glass mosaic attenuation pattern. And the presumptive diagnosis is here is HP, and it turns out that he has a bird at home, a cockatiel, 
for at least seven years. So based on that, we've made a diagnosis of HP. And I think I'm satisfied with that diagnosis. I think the appearance is pretty dramatic, but certainly this CT pattern may occur with HP. Um, pretty dramatic. I don't have any expiratory images to show you though. Everyone else confident or at least comfortable also with a presumptive diagnosis strong of hypersensitivity pneumonitis for this pattern? Absolutely. And I think the lack of right, thank you. pulmonary vascular abnormality oh, sorry, you know, makes you so not even really need right. the expiratory images. Yeah. Very good. Those are my cases. All right. Thank you, Howard. Those were very nice. Uh, David, do you have cases this week? Not this week. Sorry. No. <clears throat> All right. I've got a few. Uh, so this first case, um, I'm really curious what you guys think because this was a fascinating case. So this is a full-term infant that was a few days old and was transferred to our hospital for some congenital heart disease and a small aorta and had developed, originally had a patent ductus that closed normally. And at that point, after a few days of life, they noticed the lower extremities were becoming rather um, sort of underperfused. So this was a uh, swaddled um, CT angiogram or CT aortogram, so full torso uh, with just you know, free breathing and everything like that. On uh, And so a couple things. So first of all, you see the large pulmonary artery and this very hypoplastic aorta, three vessel left aortic arch, uh, normal origins. There is a, um, a high muscular VSD that's small. There's also a large secundum ASD, and these were all confirmed on echo as well, and you can see the right heart is enlarged. I should probably show the radiograph first. Um, you can see the sort of what looks like shunt vascularity. Um, you don't really see much of an aorta on this one as well, um, umbilical catheter, but it was a term infant. Uh, lungs were fine from morphology standpoint, but what was striking is if we follow the aorta down, there is a little irregularity here, um, and we'll come look at that. But the, initially, the blood pressure, there was no gradient between the upper and lower extremities. So, you know, it looks like maybe a coarct or coarct like portion along with the hypoplasia. But as we go down, you'll notice the, the, at the bifurcation, the iliac arteries are extremely hypoplastic. Very, very small. It goes all the way out. No irregularities of the lumen, just very hypoplastic iliac arteries. And then another interesting finding is if you look at the extremity, upper extremity, we've got a um, large right subclavian artery, break, uh, axillary artery. But then when you get out to the arm, it gets very small very quickly. And, it, you know, it's, it's hard in little kids, but you wonder if that's a little hypoplastic too. Here's a 3D volume rendered image. Whoops, let's see, I just got one. There we go. You can see just how diffusely hypoplastic the iliacs are and the, um, the arch, which is hiding there. So, um, interestingly, let's see if I can find the right one. There, we, they found, uh, my colleagues who reported this found one case report of this, um, of rare cause of absence from artery pulse, bilateral common iliac artery hypoplasia. This is 2014 from a, a Japanese pediatric journal. And they, you can see, they show the normal looking abdominal aorta, but these tiny little iliacs. And no one really knows the cause. One, one potential thing that was discussed in our reading room was congenital rubella syndrome, which can cause congenital heart disease, aortic hypoplasia. But when I was going through the uh, record, there's no nothing else that goes along with that and no, no risk factors for that, but that is another possibility. So I think the hypoplastic arch can be explained by the underlying congenital heart disease, but it doesn't explain the iliacs. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. It sounds like it's pretty rare. Wow. Hmm. Well. <clears throat> You know, there's that mid-aortic um, abdominal narrowing in that goes with neurofibromatosis, but that yeah. that's not really close to what you're seeing yeah. here. And I can't think of a good explanation for it because, you know, there's a decent sized descending aorta. Um, you know, whether or not there's a, well, there's a functional coart here. They were going to take the child to the cath lab, but I think he's got an infection, so they're holding off on that because I think they want to uh, interrogate. But what's interesting is they can't get access to the leg arteries and his arm arteries are too small. So I think their plan is to go in through the, the right heart and go across the uh, ASD to get arterial access, which I think is a pretty clever way of getting to this. 
Okay, uh, this is a quick but cool case. This is a middle-aged woman with a known diagnosis of long-standing dermatomyositis. And you can see just the extensive calcifications in the soft tissues. I don't have any cross-sectional imaging. Uh, this is the only radiograph I have, but um, you can see this, this plaque-like calcification along the chest wall and then around the joints. And this is all within the muscles primarily from dermatomyositis. She probably looks like she has a little bit of underlying lung disease, but I, I don't have a CT to prove it. Yeah, we had a case like this with lung restriction caused by all this soft tissue calcification. Oh, so the from a chest wall standpoint? Right, uh-huh. Oh, wow. Yeah, she, she, she's not, she has small volumes and scoliosis. I don't know how much this, and this is contributing that. I don't think it's quite as exuberant as, as um, you might see. Most of it's around the shoulder girdle. All right, this is an interesting case that one of my colleagues brought to my attention. So this is a patient who was admitted here with a severe necrotizing uh, streptococcus pneumoniae infection. Um, and this was her original CT angio from the, I was the emerging department looking for a pulmonary embolism. And um, you can see she's got some emphysema and then this just necrotizing consolidation, cavities, all that fun stuff. But what was noted was um, a couple of things in her aorta. And she is septic. She has staph, strep in her blood. Is sort of down here was this little bit of irregularity along the lumen of the aorta or a little bit more nodular and then further down I think there was other, other way further down um, oops I'm going the wrong way here um, right there you can see it here as well now there's an older CT we had um, that happened to be about 10 days earlier that did not show those findings there now, she does have some atherosclerosis in her abdomen, and I'm going to show you another scan, but really at that time her aorta was fine. And then this was a, um, this was a CT uh, aortogram done about two days after the first case I showed, first image I showed you. So you see she has atherosclerosis, but she's got these sort of soft tissue blobs that to me just don't look like atherosclerotic plaques and um, like this one. So, you know, our, our working diagnosis is these are probably vegetations. Um, I mean, I guess they could just be bland thrombi. They're thinking she may be thrombophilic, but it, you know, given she's septic and has this other ugly infection that these popped up in the course of a week, worried about uh, um, uh, vegetations. You can see a little one here as well. So I don't know what you guys think, but I don't... I think at least the stuff down in the abdomen, which we don't have previous imaging of, is pretty convincing, not for plaque. Yeah, it doesn't look like plaque. Yeah. So. So maybe vegetations of bacteria, et cetera, forming at, randomly at sites of atherosclerosis? Right, except in the chest, uh, there really isn't any atherosclerosis at that location. But unless it's just very minimal intimal thickening that we can't see, because mm. these little areas yeah. are on, the, on the original scan, there was nothing there. There's no plaque in that area. Alternatively, because you know, she's septic, she could be seeding the aortic wall and or endothelium and getting a little bit of injury. But it's quite impressive, and the infection itself is actually quite impressive too. Previously healthy, other than a smoker, but this is all just community acquired uh, streptococcal or pneumococcal you know, infectious pneumonia, but just really bad uh, disease. Yeah. Jeff, there wasn't any, there wasn't anything in the way of uh, aortic valve vegetations that might have needed these distal aortic sites. Not to my knowledge. I believe she had an echo. I can't confirm it, but if you look at the valve here, it looks really good. But I can't remember if we've seen aortic vegetations before. I, I, I think we've talked about them in this conference or not. Okay, this last case is interesting as well. This is a 59-year-old woman who carries a diagnosis of chronic eosinophilia, and it's unclear if it's uh, a chronic eosinophilic syndrome or just chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. She's been uh, treated with high-dose corticosteroids and does pretty well, except when they every time they taper her, she becomes symptomatic again. So he has been on steroids for several months now and they and she did come in now with about five days of worsening 
uh, symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, and had one episode of hemoptysis. And this was her presenting radiograph. And you can see there's these mass-like areas of consolidation, sort of with a background of haziness. So hemorrhage was considered, uh, I think, infection at the time. I'm not sure how much of the story was provided at the time. They told None, okay, is what I was told. Uh, so yeah, so you know, someone with hemoptysis and a CT like this, I think hem hemorrhage is a very weak consideration maybe you know there's no effusion to suggest this is all cardiac edema or anything like that now i did pull a ct from march and in retrospect at that point if you, there was some early stuff around the airways but in someone with an eosinophil you know it's just maybe residual eosinophil pneumonia so um she got a bronchoscopy and um this was the bal and you can see uh it's uh 55 percent eos her ANCA is negative, though she has some mild science disease, so probably not that uh, eosinophilic vasculitis, but probably just a flare of her chronic eosinophilic lung disease, sort of an acute eosinophilic flare. Um, and she's been treated since she's been hospitalized with high dose steroids and is already improving, which is the typical course that it improves rather quickly. But um, yeah, this is a little unusual in that it's more, it, you know, when we, it's, it's just extensive, dense consolidation. Uh, more almost more central than peripheral, but I think without the history, I don't think we would have ever come up with that as a consideration. Hmm. So chronic use in pneumonia with acute flare, right? Right. But if you look at our last CT, I don't have an older radiograph. There's, I mean, it would the radiograph would have been no, normal-ish. I mean, there's some airway thickening, there's yep. brown glass there. So I don't know if it's truly a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia or if it's more of a she's just chronically eosinophilic, there's lung involvement. And when her steroid levels get too low, the lungs get angry. It's kind of what I'm thinking. Hmm. But it's a pretty picture and it's interesting. That's a really high BAL level. So I think the problem with her is they just can't taper her steroids down. But it's unclear if this is a hyper eosinophilic syndrome, but it, she's kind of meeting criteria now because she's got organ involvement and it's been more than six months. I can't remember what the other criteria are. Your heart looks fine. Okay. Well, that is what I have this week. So I think we will, unless anybody has any last minute cases, I think we will call it a day. I think uh, Seth was asking whether her heart was okay because that's another target. For right. Her. Right. As far as I know, it's okay. Um, I, no one's investigated it thoroughly, but as far as I know, there's been no cardiac issues as far as um, infiltration of the myocardium. She's not had any cardiac MR, and I didn't find anything else about that. I think her EKG is normal. All right, thanks, well, guys. All right. Well, thank you, and uh, we will talk again next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.